Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, you can support these pro uh, programs by heading over directly to YouTube and joining the channel for even $1 a month or going to patreon.com slash Aksum. Today, we have a frequent flyer on the program. Welcome back, Dr. Benjamin Studebaker. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me again. Of course, my my pleasure. I I am always, um, you know, I'm always appreciate. Like most recently, we've just been kind of seeing each other on Twitter, but I'm always appreciating uh, your perspective because even as I was reading um, your latest book, which we're about to talk about, I was um, I was kind of chuckling to myself because I really want to know, you know, uh, pick your brain and, and see where where your thoughts come from because I. I, and maybe I just have the wrong circles, and uh, but I just I don't see the kind of thoughts that you're presenting out there, at least um, in any any semblance of a mainstream um, type of way. But your book is the Cro the chronic crisis of American democracy. The way is um, is shut. Can you give us a brief intro to what motivated you to writing this book? Yeah. So coming out of the whole. 2016 thing you know i was into the bernie thing and i was supporting bernie sanders and i did podcasts and i wrote stuff and all of that and none of that really went anywhere in fact the campaign by 2020 was much less effective at reaching a mass audience than the 2016 version all of this money and all of this organization had gone into building something and it was actually much less effective than it was at generating energy and enthusiasm so I got to thinking about why is that? And is any of that going anywhere? And as we moved into 2020, I, mean, I started writing more and more just critically about the Sanders campaign and how it was being run. And I started writing critically about left-wing media outlets and how they were approaching all of this strategically. And in the course of doing that, you, know, you get more heterodox if you're criticizing the people that you have otherwise been working with. And so over time, uh, it, it turned into a kind of, you know, where does American democracy go from here? And I became increasingly convinced that the people who had supported the Sanders campaign were now indulging in a kind of cope. Mm -hmm. They were not really uh, dealing with the failure and what the failure meant, that they were still pretending that what's going on now is, is some form of success or some form of progress, when to me clearly it's not. And at the same time, I also saw some people you know, defect and, and adopt like a right wing politics that framed the Republican Party as about to do a realignment and get you know really interested in working class issues. And this also seemed to me to be not really congruent with what was actually going on on the ground. It's not as if the Republican Party is interested in doing you know, big uh, you know, landmark changes to the international tax and trade system. The most radical idea that's come out of Trump on, uh, on tax and trade is, well, what about reciprocal tariffs? Maybe the United States can impose reciprocal tariffs on any state that tariffs American goods. And this just doesn't deal with so many of the ways in which other states uh, compete with us. They compete with us by holding down their wages. They compete with us by playing with their currencies. They compete with us by lowering their tax rates and not providing public services to anybody. Uh, you know, by dumping enormous amounts of money on state contractors that build infrastructure and build housing and all of this. None of this is, is addressed at all, really, in a lot of the, the right spaces, which are mainly focused around just doing culture critique. And I felt that a lot of people kind of ran away from the hard economic realities that we had to confront after 2020 by adopting you know, right-wing cultural positions. Uh, and in general, on both sides, the discussion became much more focused around cultural issues, around things like abortion, around things like trans politics and gender. And all of this seemed to me to be a complete abandonment of the ordinary person, the person who post-2008, post-2016, is just having a harder and harder life and getting no help. And I felt that a lot of these professionals on both the left and the right had abandoned the people that they originally got into all of this to help. And I wrote this book to kind of criticize uh, the professional class and the mm -hmm. role that the professional class is playing in American politics. Yes, this th and this is part of the unique aspect of your critique that I want to kind of um, 
delve into, especially that that latter part that you were saying about the professional class, and and you delineated a lot of them, and I was trying to see where um, I fit in as well, and, <laughs> and I was chuckling to myself as I found kind of my my place within um, the the hierarchy there, but. Um, Particularly, you hear a lot these days this talk about how you were saying re realignment. People talk about alignment in AI, but also in, in politics and realignment, and specifically this horseshoe uh, theory. Uh, the idea that, um, you know, and it all depends. I think in a couple times we've had you on, we've discussed um, the way people use terms like left, right, center. They're, they kind of, they change over time and place and usage, and you have a particular way in which you use them, and I've heard them in... In, in different ways. You helped me, I remember, originally think about it in terms of um, systems thinking versus individual thinking. Um, but do you think there's anything to this horseshoe theory? Like I've heard some people, for example, like a type like Glenn Greenwald will try to say that there is a left-wing populism and a right-wing populism. And so he will try to be a part of that uh, alignment or a realignment. You mentioned uh, throughout your book, um, people of like the um, I think you mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, Chapo, like the of the dirtbag left, alongside uh, people who've written for like Current Affairs and Jacobin. Um, but there are other groups like you know Red Scare and Come Town, which maybe blend those uh, those those wings or genres and and do that stuff. Do you believe in horseshoe theory? Because at least uh, the rhetoric is there uh, for, like you said, for uh, tariffs and and protectionism or mercantilism, whatever we're we're calling it, versus like a, a globalized market or neoliberalism. Well, I I wouldn't say that I believe in horseshoe theory. I do believe mm -hmm. that it's necessary to build a broad movement that cuts across cultural divisions and antagonisms that can include people with different views about religion, about morality. Uh, that is is open and syncretic on those lines. The difficulty is that the way that American politics is constructed, it's constructed in terms of organizations that have commitments, first and foremost, to cultural positions rather than yes. economic positions, and which oppositionalize along those lines. So when I was involved in the lefty spaces in you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, we were trying to get the left to offer a campaign that was more inclusive to mm -hmm. people with different cultural values who come from different parts of the country. And uh, that push for diversity really fell on deaf ears and didn't work very well. The money that was coming into the left uh, was coming from people who had very specific cultural motivations yes. in getting involved. And the uh, what we tended to find is that whenever you start an organization that includes working class people who don't go to college and professional class people who do go to college, the professional class people tend to push the working class people out of the organization, not just in the sense that they tend to have more influence and make more of the decisions, but the working class people get fed up and they quit. So mm -hmm. if you look at you know, DSA, all of the working class people are gone from DSA. People talk about how DSA is a, a white organization yeah. or a male organization. It's a college educated organization yeah. first and foremost. That's what it is. It's just people who went to college and very, very few other people. You look at the districts that the left is, is competing in, it's only heavily gerrymandered bright blue districts where Hillary Clinton won 70% plus of the vote. Uh, you know, almost every district that a Justice Democrat endorsed candidate or a DSA endorsed candidate has won in has been that kind of district. And the left talks about gerrymandering like it's in the way. The left wouldn't have any level of representation right now in Congress without gerrymandering, which is really a shocking thing. And so I think that uh, in practice, while there are some people who are theoretically influenced in a, in a more broad-based movement, when we look at the political economy of how American politics operates, it's very difficult to make that kind of organization. In the last chapter of my book, I talk about this idea of a, a paraparty, an organization that drafts candidates uh, to run in both parties for the same seats. So an organization that tries to win specific seats by running both a Democrat and a Republican in the mm -hmm. primaries at the same time, with the goal of having both candidates running against each other in the general. But you know, if only one of them wins, at least you've got a chance in that general election. And that would be a strategy that would emphasize trying to win middle ground districts instead of the already heavily polarized districts, a kind of purple district strategy. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's very difficult to get this kind of thing off the ground, in part because in these primaries, the chief way that you 
uh, beat somebody up is by accusing them of, of not towing the line on cultural stuff. Yes. That's the key way that you make sure that people who have unusual views about economics don't get ahead. Yeah, it, it, this is, um, gosh, there's so many directions, but th this is exactly the point that makes you unique. And it's the question I have is, how can you make this replicatable, which I think is the question that you're asking yourself throughout the um, the book. You talk about like this uh, gerrymandering, and then I want to get back to this professional working class distinction, because I have my own experiences um, with that as well, and the sort of uh, the culture war. But as a kind of example, uh, you speak of Nina Turner and that district can you can you tell people who nina turner is and what exactly happened in that situation i, I remember that a lot because actually a rapper that i like killer mike was highlighting her cause a lot at the time yeah so nina turner was i think head of our revolution so she was playing a leading role in the major organization that was fundraising for bernie sanders and for candidates that bernie sanders was endorsing so in uh, a district in Ohio that contains parts of Columbus and Akron, I think. Uh, it's a very weird gerrymandered district that somehow has parts of two major cities in it that are quite some distance apart. That helps. Uh, she, she runs in this district. And uh, it's a district where, again, Hillary Clinton won a very large percentage of the general election vote in 2016. The Democrat is definitely going to win the general election, so you only have to run one campaign, and that's a primary campaign. So the assumption here is, okay, this is someone who is heavily involved with fundraising for the left, who knows a lot about uh, how to raise money, was able to raise a competitive amount of money for many parts of the campaign, had more money and was spending more money than her centrist opponent. She nonetheless goes on to lose the campaign by five points. And when she lost, it fascinated me how people on the left coped with this defeat. So you had people who said, well, what happened was that there was an influx of dark money at the last mm -hmm. moment. There was a bunch of money that showed up for the centrist candidate. And this pile of money at the end, that's what ultimately persuaded people not to support Nina Turner. The same writer who wrote that piece for Jacobin, Luke Savage, who I'm sure is a perfectly lovely guy, and I have no beef with on a personal level, but he had, al he had also written previously for Jacobin that you know, stuff like campaign finance reform would not solve our problems organizing in the United States because there are countries with much tougher campaign finance law and those countries are also drifting to the right. And why are they drifting to the right? Because if you want to attract capital, then you need lower rates of tax and then you need lower uh, uh, spending on public services. If you want to attract capital, you need your wages to be under control. So you can't have very strong labor unions or labor movements. You know, all of that goes without saying. So all of these countries are subject to the same competitive incentives. So they all tend to go the same way. It doesn't really matter whether you have campaign finance reform or not in this respect. Uh, so he acknowledges all of this in this other piece that he writes. So Nina Turner, she lost because we don't have good campaign finance reform. Uh, if we did have good campaign finance reform, it wouldn't be enough. We would need you know, other procedural reforms too. Now, if you have campaign finance reform, what tends to happen is that the Supreme Court will block it or will gut most of it. As we know, that's happened many times previously because the Supreme Court regards spending as a form of speech, right? So you're not very likely to be able to pass campaign finance reform and win by doing that, even if it is the case that campaign finance reform is enough. So A, we can't do campaign finance reform. B, if we did campaign finance reform, it wouldn't be enough. Mm -hmm. So how is Nina Turner supposed to win? Well, you know, Turner already has the benefit of a heavily gerrymandered district that's not representative of the rest of the country. Uh, and even with that, she can't win uh, or can't win by very much. And if she had one, even if she had one, this would have just led these people to believe that they had a strategy that works when it's a strategy that only allows you to eke out narrow wins in a half a dozen to a dozen heavily gerrymandered districts that Hillary Clinton won with 70% plus of the vote. It's, it's madness. But nobody is willing to just say hey wait a minute the whole strategy we're working with here doesn't make any sense because if you acknowledge that this strategy doesn't work then people will stop donating money to the organizations mm -hmm. and there's a ton of people now who are employed in these organizations so even though they no longer see any way strategically or tactically of realizing their objectives like medicare for all or tuition free college uh, or a job guarantee or major infrastructure spending you know beyond the piddling an inadequate bill that got through um, under Biden. Uh, you know, they've dropped any pretense of really pushing for those policies and are just focused on how can we 
keep getting elected and you know, marginally expand the number of seats that we control as a faction within the Democratic Party. Uh, and that way of thinking is just completely stalled everything out. Uh, and it's, it's killing energy, it's sapping people's energy, and it's driving people who used to support this movement either into the right or into despair. Yeah, and as far as I know, you're not part of that, um, I guess, democratic machine dole. Um, and that's a <laughs> obvious reason why you wouldn't um, succumb to that. But I, but I think that, you know, there's something kind of even prior to that why you're not on the dole, not just the fact that you're not on it, but there's something prior to that which kind of um, raises my, my previous question. Um, can you talk about what it means? Because your you, you're talking reminds me of this thing that the Italian School of Political Science talks about as the, the iron rule of oligarchy, that, that elites always tend to dominate any sort of group that, that forms. Could you talk about the difference between professional class and working class folks in how they organize, because it seems like this is where the fundamental disagreement is, where someone like Nina Turner and even someone like Bernie, they seem to have certain immovable values that you're talking about, which are the, the social cultural ones, even though they have the economic uh, values as well, but they're less willing to give those up to the same degree that you are willing to like even you know use whatever party it is to make sure that the the economic uh goals are happening so could you talk a little bit more about this tension between and the different types of uh, people in professional and working class environments yeah so i see kind of a couple of different points there one is kind of how how the democratic party machine works and another is to do with just the basic class structure so i think to kind of get the class structure terms out in my book i have three broad classes, the working class, the professional class, and the employers. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, the working class I regard as those who didn't go to college and have a boss. The professional class is those who do go to college, but still get most of their income from wages or a salary. They don't get it mainly from investments or property or holdings, right? And I, I make a division within the professional class there's the rump professionals. These mm -hmm. are the people who are living the lives that they expected to have when they made the decision to go to college. They are getting what you're told you get if you go to college, something like a six-figure income that's very comfortable in a job that is related to your major. And then there's the fallen professionals who are not that's getting what they that's, expect. That's when I chuckled. That's what I chuckled. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm part of the fallen professionals. Yeah, the fallen professionals are not getting what it is that they were looking to get. They are really making an income that is similar to a working class income. Uh, oftentimes, it's not better than, say, what someone in uh, working in a steel factory in the 70s would have done if you adjust for inflation. Certainly, it doesn't come with a pension that uh, somebody who worked in a steel factory in the 70s would have been theoretically entitled to if the steel factory stayed open long enough for them to collect it, right? Uh, so... Uh, I make that division, and I think it's really important because the, the fallen professionals are in this difficult situation where they think that they're better than the workers because they have college degrees and they're educated and they can use the terms that they learned from college, but they don't actually live better than the workers in any meaningful sense. So there's the only way they can differentiate themselves is through cultural signifiers that show that they went to college, and because they don't want to wrestle with the fact that they've gone to college and not ended up really any better off than they would otherwise have been economically, they lean in very heavily to these cultural signifiers. And the rump professionals take advantage of this. The rump professionals go, you're educated, so you should support this. You're educated, so you should support that. You should follow me because we're educated people and we aren't like those uh, working class people who are bigoted and don't like immigrants and don't like all the all these different groups of people. You're not like them, right? That's why you follow me and you do all the things that I say that you ought to do. Uh, that's what I really think is going on in the professional class. Just like sometimes workers are aspirational to be small business owners, uh, the fallen professional is aspirational to be a rump professional. And this prevents the fallen professional from being fully honest with themselves about the situation that they're in. At the same time, whenever there is an organization that includes fallen professionals and workers, the college education gives the fallen professional a rhetorical leg up and allows the fallen professional to usually manage to outcompete the worker 
for influence within a small organization like something like the DSA, right? Uh, within the employer box, I also make a distinction. I think a lot of left-wing people don't bother to do this because they hate employers so much they won't make the distinction, but I do between the oligarchs, the people who own large amounts of money that they can move all over the world, who have major stakes in large corporations, and the small employers who are tethered to a particular spot. They have a business that relies on the performance of the economy in a particular place, and therefore they have a vested interest in that place and can't, uh, if something goes wrong in that place, easily recoup their investment by relocating it all over the world. And I think that the people who are in that box are very anxious because if you're in the United States and the situation is getting harder for the workers and the professionals, well, the small employer is going to find that it's harder to be sure what kind of money they're going to make year to year. Uh, they're going to be more worried that you know if there's rising crime or rising poverty yes. in the area, that that's going to affect their business. And all of that is going to cause them to view this as a crisis in a way that an oligarch will not. However, an oligarch will tell the small business owner, if we do anything to try to improve the situation for workers and professionals, you're the one who's going to have to pay for it. You're the one who won't be able to afford the higher wages. You're the one who will go broke. So you have to support all of the policies that enable the oligarchs to get stronger, even though these will gradually weaken your own customer base and the economy of your own local region. Because if you don't, then they'll just jack up the tax rates and jack up the wages and you'll go bust. So the small business owner who aspires to be one of the oligarchs, mm -hmm. again, there's the aspirational aspect, uh, will tend to go along with that, even though it's not in their interests either, I think, in the long term. Uh, and all of these classes will not really get together and work because they all have this aspirational quality to them, and they're all chasing after some part of the elite that they imagine they could one day become part of. So that's what's going on in the classes. As far as the Democratic Party goes and how this organization works in terms of worker movements, if you go back to the 50s and the New Deal Coalition, the New Deal Coalition was based in the labor unions and it was based on the idea that uh, the way to empower the ordinary working person is to get them a good quality job with benefits, pensions, access to health care, all of these things. Uh, put them in a labor union, organize it, right? Uh, and then one person is in the labor force per family. That person makes a good enough income to support the whole family. The rest of the family is protected from participation in the labor force by that one person and their sizable income. And uh, that enables somebody in the family to stay at home with the kids. And that uh, frees the kids from an enormous amount of pressure to get into the labor force too early. And that allows you to get rid of child labor. It allows mm -hmm. you to have a spouse that's at home. The new left's critique in the 60s was that uh, actually what was happening is that only men were getting into the labor force and that women didn't have opportunities to enter if they wanted to enter. And since your autonomy was tied to having this income, women couldn't really have autonomy as long as they weren't entering the labor force. Now, the left took the view in the 60s increasingly that you couldn't just bring women into the labor force and expand this model because automation was kicking off. In the 50s and 60s, there was all this futurism. and People thought, well, there aren't going to be any more jobs. You know, we're we're going to shrink dramatically the number of jobs that are needed. Even you know, John Maynard Keynes made the argument that by now we'd have a four-hour workday because there would be so little work to do. Right. So if you're not going to expand the jobs model, then uh, it becomes necessary to find some other way of giving people access to stuff that stands apart from being married to somebody with a job or getting a job yourself. And so the left in the 60s became more interested in uh, alternative ways of getting people resources and increasingly in cash transfers and in things like eventually basic income, which mm -hmm. became a huge idea on both the left and the right yeah. as a way of giving people money, ignoring that you know this doesn't ensure that you actually get the things that you need with the money. It may just be a subsidy, which further gooses the prices of all of those things. If it's difficult to provide things like housing or healthcare or university education, or in those cases, you have a, a lot of leverage if you're the one who provides it because it's so necessary. People need a house and they need uh, an education and they need health care. And this has a very strong inflationary effect on prices in those sectors if you leave it up to the market. You know, the cash transfer doesn't really deal with any of that. It treats all of that as a black box, as stuff you can't touch. So nevertheless, I think in, in general, there was an abandonment of the worker, a, a feeling that the worker was a labor aristocrat who was like a feudal baron presiding over a family on behalf of capital and that he'd somehow been brought into or the male labor had been brought into the, the capitalist system through the labor union. 
and that therefore you had to abandon this person who is now too comfortable to be revolutionary and find a new revolutionary subject. And the place to find that was in people who didn't have jobs, so in women and mm -hmm. in racial minority groups that were underrepresented in the labor force. And so the transition started to focus on them, also on third world movements, on movements in developing countries where this system had not yet taken hold. And uh, you know, so that's where the, the pivot really starts to set in, I think, in the 60s, in the way that the left is viewing all of these things. And it culminates in the McGovern campaign, where McGovern takes you know, a very uh, progressive stance on Vietnam, and he takes very progressive stances on cultural issues affecting race and gender, but he more or less cuts the labor unions out of the campaign, alienates all of the major labor union leaders, and uh, ticks all of the workers off. And so Nixon gets a big majority uh, in part off of all of that. And I think really ever since then, the tendency in the Democratic Party has been to become more and more like the McGovern campaign on the premise that while in 1972, you couldn't really run a campaign like that because more and more people are going to college and the population is getting less white and less male, mm -hmm. that over time, demographically, it will become possible to have a McGovern campaign that's a success and to do McGovern type politics in a way that is successful. I think that's basically uh, been increasingly the direction of the Democratic Party. And at this point, the Democratic Party is further right on economic issues than McGovern was, uh, considerably further right, you know, really even than uh, it, it was in the 80s with, uh, with Carter and Mondale, you know, much further right on uh, all of those issues. And more or less just acquiescing to the idea that there's a competitive global economy that dictates low rates of tax, which means poor public service provision, uh, which dictates uh, that you do whatever is necessary to attract capital in terms of your labor policy and your wage policy and just complies across the board on all of that. Uh, you know, to the point where I went to see Bernie Sanders talk. This was, I think, in uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. I went to see him talk when he was promoting the the uh, Build Back Better bill back when it Joe was Biden's big, you know, program, yeah, yeah, the 3.5 trillion dollar version of it before it got mm -hmm. cut you know, repeatedly. And he said, you know, in this competitive global economy, it's just not practical to have a parent at home. So what we we need to do is ensure that there are people who are paid money to take care of other people's children. Mm -hmm. And we're going to make sure that everybody can have someone else raise their children so that they can participate in the labor force. What, what kind of notion of freedom is this? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense at all to anybody on, who hasn't you know, spent many, many years in a university uh, not really paying attention to what all of this means. Yeah, this is this seems to be, I think, where the rubber meets the road in the difference. And I get this, the message is, I think, clear in your book and clear from hearing you now that the, the kind of Bernie mistake as you see it and as I'm hearing it is this, um, this comfortability with the status quo, with it not being that bad. And you discuss kind of issues with trimming or reformation as well as the more radical uh, revolution as well in your text, but this kind of uh, democratic status quo appreciation and thing, saying, hey, look, uh, better a little bit of progress than we regress too much by having like, you know, another four years of Trump. Uh, whereas I think you are, and you correct me if I'm wrong, seeing had Trump won in 2020 as not so different from the status quo. And thus, like your goal is to then make kind of systemic changes that are significant, that are not... Um, just trimming can can you talk about the kind of uh, if that's if that's right and the issues with reformation and revolution yeah i'm really just very focused on if you really are going to make sure that people have basic rights to things like housing health care education uh, energy if these are things we actually care about rather than just things we say to get people to vote uh, what would that actually involve what would we have to do to actually do all of that uh, and there's just no serious, really, at all seriousness at all about it. People will go, well, eventually it will work out if we just get a few more seats here or there. They they work with timelines that are are really only timelines you could endorse if you didn't give a shit, frankly. Uh, you know, or you don't care about anybody who's alive because you're a long-termist who thinks that only future people matter. This is the kind of thinking that's become 
just dominant all over the place. And I do think it comes from people being a little bit too comfortable. Rump professionals who have a little bit too much comfort, don't mind so much if it takes a while. And what's really important is to be able to stay rump professionals and not get kicked out. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what, what was the, uh, the other part so, of that again? So, so yeah, like I guess the, the main question I want to know, because it's like a replicatable thing that I'm trying to, I'm trying to see, is this something innate to Dr. Benjamin Studebaker or is it replicatable? Like, what is it that makes you have this value that sees the kind of, like you are looking at the status quo and the comfort of the rump uh, professionals as something dire. They are not seeing it as dire. How can, how could we replicate this kind of uh, this sense or this feeling that you have that the situation right now is dire and not something to be uh, trimmed at. Yeah, so I think you know, there's the arguments that I make about it being dire. So the arguments, would be, there's kind of arguments and then there's why am I this way? So I think those are probably two separate questions. T to do the arguments, basically, all of the reforms that people talk about don't actually tackle the incentives that cause all states around the world to move inexorably in this direction, including all rich countries, they come from different baselines. Uh, they come from different, you know, different political systems that allow it to move faster or slower. But the trend in all of these countries is lower taxes, weaker public services, lower wages, uh, less influence for workers, uh, and a freer flowing uh, environment for capital. The attempts to deal with this with reform, never actually get at the bottom of it. So Biden will, for instance, say that he supports a minimum rate of corporation tax around the world. But then you look at what the rate is, and the rate is lower than the current rate in the United States. So even if it were imposed, it would then just be an excuse to cut the rate to the level that is being talked about uh, by Biden. When you start looking at trade policy, you know, Donald Trump you know, has very muscular rhetoric with trade policy, but when you actually look at the numbers, what happened while he was president, there was a 6% cut in goods imports from China and an enormous explosion in goods imports from Vietnam. We didn't actually you know, level the playing field in any substantial way. We just kind of slid the jobs down the coast from mm -hmm. Shanghai to Saigon, as I like to put it. <laughs> uh, you know, so there's nobody actually doing the kinds of reforms that would matter. Then you, you look at, okay, well, what would go into doing these reforms? Let's say that you really were going to go around and say, okay, you can't trade with the United States unless you pay your workers something comparable to what we pay our workers, unless you give your workers comparable benefits to what we give our workers. You know, unless you do all of these things, you can't just uh, ship stuff in with sweatshop labor. The response to these countries would be, you're, you're stifling our ability to develop because we don't have the capacity to pay our workers wages that are competitive with the level to which you can pay your workers. Uh, we would end up severing a lot of trade links with those countries. There would be an enormous increase in the costs of goods uh, in the United States because we would disrupt all of the supply chains that we currently rely on, and that would produce a huge amount of inflation. Even mm -hmm. the inflation we got from COVID, which was a very partial and fleeting disruption to all of this, it was really very trivial. It astounded me, by the way, how many left-wing people frame that as the end of neoliberalism, a new era is dawn, because they want this to be true. It's wishful thinking. But actually, it was a very fleeting disruption, and we continue to import an enormous amount from China. It's hardly changed at all. People talk, oh, Biden is continuing the Trump trade war on China. There never really was such a thing in any meaningful sense. 6% reduction in goods and services is hardly a trade war. It's because these people oppose these policies that they make every trivial thing out to be this gigantic violation of the logic. Because when you make even a small deviation into a giant violation of the logic, it makes large deviations completely unthinkable. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you know, the media frames, every deviation is this gigantic thing. And it's very, very small when you actually look at the, the effect. So none of the reforms are actually coming anywhere close to tackling this. You know, people like Thomas Piketty, when he wrote his book uh, about you know, global or uh, regional taxes on wealth, uh, you know, 10 years ago, everybody said, well, this is a completely utopian idea. You can't, you can't do this. Well, if you can't do this, where are you supposed to get the revenue to re, you know, breathe you know, life back into the public services? How are, you, how are you doing that? Where are you getting the tax money from? without you know, chasing all of this investment somewhere else in the world. And of course, all countries will, if you start to raise your rates, you start to push up your wages, they'll look to exploit that if you continue to trade with them. And if you don't trade with them, then you have to deal with the cost of cutting the supply chains. I think really the only thing that could happen that would actually sever supply chains or disrupt this system to the degree that it would actually make a difference would be something like a war. 
with mm -hmm. China, which yeah. is not something anybody wants because a war is enormously costly. Uh, Walter Schiedel, the economic historian, talks about I, nobody's ever really been able to do meaningful leveling to disrupt you know, concentrated centers of power without violence and without some level of chaos or revolutionary violence, war, pandemics. But when he says pandemics, he's talking the plague. He's not talking COVID. When he says wars, he's talking World War II. He's not talking about Iraq or mm -hmm. even Ukraine. You know, the scale that is necessary oftentimes to deliver meaningful changes is difficult for people really to grapple with. And I think one thing that, that we have now that makes this period fundamentally different from any other period, and I hate all the historical comparisons to the 30s and 1840. I used to make these myself. I mm -hmm. hate them now. I hate all of them because the thing that's different is that there is no confidence in the ordinary person that there is an alternative to this system, that there is an alternative to democratic capitalism. Uh, no confidence in any alternative because fascism, uh, the fascist states, they comprehensively failed. The communist states, they comprehensively failed. Uh, if you look around the world at other systems of government that exist, none of these are compelling to the ordinary person. Nobody wants to live in uh, the PRC. Nobody wants to live under Vladimir Putin. Nobody wants to live under the Shah of Iran. These models are not at all compelling. And nobody's coming up with new models. All anybody's doing is saying, well, if you pass a little campaign finance reform, we'll get a few more people elected next time. And then maybe we'll increase the marginal tax rate a little bit. None of this solves anything. Uh, none of it ever will. So that would be in terms of why I don't think any of this stuff is working. In terms of me and why I'm like this, I think I'll, uh, I, you know, I would like to say it's because I'm a virtuous person. You know, <laughs> I read the right books and blah, blah, blah. No, but none of that's true. The reason I'm like this is that I have great parents who are cool with me making the kind of stuff that I think is, is important or good or you know, in some way helpful, uh, even if it doesn't immediately cause me to make uh, you know, significant amounts of money. I'm not under the gun to make money from 18 you know, in the way that a lot of people in this country, I would dare say very nearly everybody in this country mm -hmm. is. We're at a point where even billionaires go, I'm not gonna let my kids inherit any money because I think they should endure precarity so that they are toughened up, yeah. right? Uh, when you have this attitude that everybody has to, from a very early point in life, get serious and think about what makes money, the things that you have to do if you're committed to making money are necessarily antagonistic with the things that you would be doing if you were just trying to find the good if you were just trying to find uh, what is true, it's very different. And we really, really are incentivized to ignore this and to persuade ourselves that there is no antagonism because in practical fact, nearly everybody in this society has to do whatever is necessary to make money from a very early age. Very nearly everybody. There's no path to doing any of the things that ordinary people wanna do in their lives if they don't make money. Uh, and because of this, it's very, very difficult for people to, to face up to. If you don't have the resources or a, a, a level of courage that is downright frightening to just, without the resources, just barrel ahead, uh, it's gonna be really difficult to think in this kind of way. You have enormous, we all have uh, enormous economic incentives to not think like this. Uh, it's dangerous to your livelihood to think like this. Uh, and the reason for this is increasingly, you know, even you think about the places that you know, are strongholds for lefty academics, like the universities, right, in theory. In practice at this point, state funding for the universities is declining. The universities are increasingly getting their money from tuition or from outside third-party organizations that have ties to oligarchic wealth. So the universities are increasingly, you know, when they hire people, they go, are you good at getting external funding? Are you good at getting grants? What kind of relationship do you have with oligarchic money? Are you able to bring oligarchic money to our university? And then when you're dealing with the students, it's a question of, are you delivering student satisfaction? Do the students like what you're doing? Are we getting students? Are more of them coming here? And one of the things that the universities realize is they can get a lot of 18 year olds if they spend a bunch of money on very nice buildings and facilities. Uh, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference if they pay their academics more. 
And indeed, 18 year olds don't know the difference between being taught by a, somebody with a bachelor's degree, you know, or even someone without a bachelor's degree who's a TA and somebody with a PhD. Oftentimes they find the person with the BA, you know, who, the TA more accessible because they're younger and more relatable. The student satisfaction is often higher when the teacher is less experienced and knows less because the teacher is more likely to talk to the students on their level. So the overwhelming trends in the system are to uh, squeeze out people who don't find a way to make themselves amenable to all of this. And it's mm -hmm. because I've been protected by a family structure that I am not in this mess to the same degree that everybody else is in it. I have a little bit more freedom than other people do to uh, be, be me. That, yeah, no, that's a very a solid point. Um especially working class folks uh, of all the groups that you kind of listed, if you don't have a ton of time for leisure and if you're kind of compelled to, you know, work or, or die, uh, it's going to be a very tough situation for you to pontificate on these matters in the first place, let alone to get to the kind of uh, new conclusions that you're getting to. You mentioned the specters of these 20th century ghosts, communism and fascism, and, and discuss how the left and the right are using these uh, boogeymen and hobgoblins to kind of distract from the main um, economic issues. Why are you not convinced by, you know, th there was, for example, I think you mentioned the scholar Jason Stanley about, and he was one of many who just, you know, orange Cheeto Hitler is uh, around the corner. There's going to be fascism in the United States. Democracy is abandoned. On the other side, you have uh, Cuban expats uh, in Florida uh, yelling communismo against uh, Joe Biden, you know, that, that Joe Biden of all people is the uh, the bearer of communism. Why are you unafraid of either uh, Stalin-like, uh, you know, uh, tanky communism or, uh, you know, Hitlerian or Mussolinian uh, fascism around the corner in the United States? So sometimes I like to play a little game with people, which is who's the revolutionary subject? Right. And some people go, it's the working class. And some people will go, it's the uh, ethnic minorities and women. And uh, it's it's trans people and it's people with college degrees. And what I always like to say is it's people with guns. People <laughs> with guns are the revolutionary subject, because ultimately, anytime, you know, let's say that you get exactly what you want. You have a general strike. Right. And, and everybody refuses to go to work because they're tired of the system and they want a new government. So everybody refuses to go to work, or if you're on the right, you know, Donald Trump says, let's all march on DC and everybody goes, right? Everybody goes. Ultimately, if you're gonna send everybody back to work, what the state has to do is it has to tell the troops to clear out that mess. It has to send the cops and the troops out to clear it out. And the only way the government falls is if the troops say no in that situation and refuse to clear everybody out. You look at any color revolution, uh, any revolution that's occurred now, in recent history, it requires troops refusing. And of course, if only some of the troops refuse, you have a civil war. There has to be a critical mass among the troops to avoid a civil war in that situation. And for that reason, by the way, a lot of the time, the troops may not feel so good about clearing everybody out, but if they think there would be a civil war if they don't clear everybody out, they'll often clear everybody out to avoid a civil war. So you really need an overwhelming critical mass of dissent within the military and opposition to the government. Now, the thing I always like to point out to people on the left is that when you looked at the active duty soldiers and you polled them, the approval ratings for Trump among active duty soldiers in the run up to the 2020 election were, if anything, lower than the general population. His poll numbers were weaker with active duty troops than with the general population. Now you look at the officer corps or the generals on the Joint Chiefs, these people hated him. You look at the security services, the CIA, the FBI, these people clearly hate him. So none of these people were going to support any attempt by Trump to stage a military coup. These are the people he would need to be able to do that. Same goes for the, the justices, right? When they brought the case to the Supreme Court about the election, all of the justices, including the Trump appointed justices, threw the case out. So if even the tr people who owe things to Trump will not support him in the government, and the military is not going to support him, and the security services aren't going to support him. 
how is it supposed to happen? Well, people go, ah, he's, he says authoritarian things. And this is the elevation of speech. As it becomes less and less possible for the state to take meaningful action, people start to imagine that everything everybody says is important and that actually you know, it's politicians who cause mass shootings by talking. Uh, this is the way that we start to think, oh, if politicians say this or that, this is you know, hate speech that will cause violence to occur. It's imputing words with this magical power because nobody does anything anymore. The state rarely takes meaningful action. So everything people say now is, is inflated in its importance. And the journalists in particular, they hated the way he talked. So they decided that the way he talked meant that he had the capacity to take the state uh, without really looking in any kind of intelligent way at all of that. Somebody like Stanley you know, looks at the rhetoric and looks at the language and looks at the ideas, but this is not where revolution happens. Revolution happens when the guy with the gun is given an order he doesn't follow. That's the only situation in which it occurs. And the same thing goes the other way. You know, it, it's harder for me to argue to people on the left that the soldiers don't support Trump than it would be for me to argue that uh, the soldiers don't support communism. <laughs> it, it seems very <laughs> obvious that the soldiers don't support communism, right? So it's not as if there's going to be some kind of revolution. Uh, in, also, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that the reason that the senators and uh, so on uh, you know, get behind Donald Trump, you know, or historically did get behind Donald Trump, you know, Lindsey Graham and Chris Christie and all that, that pile of people, is because they imagined that by being friendly with Donald Trump, that would improve their numbers with the base, which would set them up in the future to run for higher office, maybe be president, right? So if you make Donald Trump a dictator, that destroys the purposes of supporting Donald Trump. Most of the people who support Donald Trump support him because they think by supporting him, they can advance their own personal ambitions. If he's a dictator, then they can't advance their personal ambitions because he's not giving up being a dictator. So he can't be a dictator and still have the support of all of those people. And the same goes for anyone on the left who would try to do that. All of these other people in the Democratic Party have their own ambitions, and those people can't see their ambitions realized if they let somebody be a dictator. You know, it's just as silly as all the Obamianism stuff from you know, 2009, which was just completely preposterous. But people don't see it. When they're doing the same thing in reverse, they don't see it. And people come back at me with, well, what about January 6th? What about January 6th? What, what would have happened? Like, what if it was the worst case scenario and the January 6th protesters had gotten into the Capitol and they just killed everybody they could find, right? If that had actually happened, uh, soldiers would have showed up at the Capitol and the soldiers would have then gone into the building and killed all of the people who went into the building, right? And then we would have a new election and we'd vote for new people. All of the states, the, the rules that they have for replacing people, all of those would kick in. And all of the people who were killed would get replaced. Now, are the people who are in the, the House or in the Senate so indispensable that we would get rid of the system that we use for picking them? No, if anything, we would go, we have to defend the system and therefore we're going to rigidly stick to the rules, right? We would replace all of them through the existing rules. And the fact that they were all killed would be a major, uh, of major benefit to the system itself, which would, take that terrorist act as a major uh, you know, propaganda coup for itself. That would be, look, look at the, the horrible things that are happening because we're insufficiently committed to the system. And that would, I think, if anything, increase people's level of commitment to the system going forward. Very good. And can you, can you tell me then with these kind of um, institutional safe barriers kind of settled on both sides that you've said, what are the kind of understandings? Because people use different words, right? America is a democracy. America is a democratic republic. Could you talk about the kind of different understandings of what this thing is, the system is uh, that we're talking about that has such strong safe barriers? Yeah, one, one of the chapters in my book is really focused around how we no longer agree on what democracy means. Uh, and on what it means for the United States to be a democracy, to the point where, as you say, some people don't even want to use the word democracy. They want to use democratic republic or republic or compound republic or you know, other kinds of terms to describe what it is. 
And I think you also see this in, say, the cultural rights emphasis on there being a kind of unitary American nation with an American way of life that we all participate in. And on the left, a, a kind of diversity politics focused around many different kinds of identities. And America allows all of these different identities to exist at the same time and coexist alongside. Yeah, America. which is the really the classic salad bowl versus melting pot analogy that they kind of right. Put up, right? Two completely different conceptions of democratic society. And one, you know, the, the social conservative one almost sounds like a European nation state mentality. It sounds you know, kind of out, of out of touch with a lot of what we've been doing. And on the other side, uh, this uh, group, uh, uh, group oriented theory, it doesn't really sync up with the kind of individualism that's often been a big part of the American story. So I think there are issues with, with both of those theories in terms of actually speaking to what America historically has been, but they're not really historical theories. They pretend to be historical theories, but really normative theories about what people think America ought to be now. Uh, and you know, alongside that, there are major, major differences uh, in terms of just what people want out of the procedures. So if you look at a lot of centrists, what a lot of centrists want is credibility. They think that what's great about American procedures is this rule of law that they create, where no matter who you are in the society, the law will treat you uh, in an equal way, and that this, this rule of law is the thing that you ultimately really need to protect about democracy. It's what sets democracy apart from other kinds of regimes, where you know, if the ruler dies, the next ruler might have completely different views and might be arbitrary and mm -hmm. might you know, ignore the law or change the law in various ways, right? Or there could be, you know, you shoot the leader and then suddenly it's chaos, who knows what's going to happen. Conversely, I think on both the left and the right, not to overly horseshoe this, but I do think that both the left and the right are worried about dynamism, worried about the capacity of the system to deliver change. Uh, and are, are concerned that it, it doesn't promote enough dynamism. Now, dynamism and credibility conflict with each other because a system that is credible, that will behave on the basis of the same rules or principles reliably, no matter who you are across time, is different from a system that responds to the new things that people want, right? At the same time, though, there's a strong tradition of framing dynamism as the thing that sets democracy apart. You know, the, the authoritarian leader who suppresses dissent because he doesn't he can't brook any challenge to himself. He never hears about the problems that are going on in society because he, he doesn't want anybody even to feel comfortable enough to voice those things. You know, or the dictator who, uh, you know, once he commits to trying to solve a crisis in a particular way, uh, can't you turn on the crisis without losing face. And since the system can't replace him with another party, uh, the dictator doubles down on a failing policy that makes the situation worse and worse and worse over time. And these narratives about authoritarian regimes producing famine because they suppress uh, concerns about food or you know, force them to, you know, say in China under Xi Jinping, commit to a lockdown policy that is draconian and be unable to get off of it or reverse it. So those are you know, two different critiques of authoritarianism and promotions of democracy, but they don't fit at all. And the procedures that you'd want to get, one of those advantages or the other, are completely different from each other. The United States is very gridlocky because it uh, doesn't emphasize dynamism as much as, say, uh, a centralized European mm -hmm. democracy with a unicameral chamber that's really powerful. Right? And conversely, those unicameral chambers that are you know, theoretically really powerful, you know, those things don't necessarily give you the same level of credibility across time. Sometimes they do result in uh, major shifts in the way European states make policy. Less so in recent years, though, because those European states have all become embedded in the European Union, and the European Union blunts the degree to which those unicameral legislatures can take weird turns in uh, directions they might not otherwise go. Part of what attracted people to Brexit, of course, the yes. issue with Brexit is that the UK is too small an economy to take a unilateral strategy and make it work. So I think there's all of that going on. At the same time, when you start talking about fear of authoritarianism, what people are fearing is very different. Some people are fearing a tyrant, which is a person who can make arbitrary decisions, violate the rule of law, do whatever they want, uh, and not be checked by anything. And other people are fearing a totalitarian system of bureaucrats, an, an impersonal system that's Kafka-esque, that's bigger than any of the particular people who participate in it. And the easiest way to, to see this difference is in, say, a CEO of a private company who can do all sorts of strange, irrational stuff that wouldn't seem to make any sense to people from outside, even if it loses money in the near term because he doesn't answer to shareholders and the CEO of a publicly traded company who is completely locked into a particular form of institutional logic. And if the CEO deviates from that logic in any kind of major way, uh, will immediately be booted out. 
uh, unless that CEO has enormous amounts of confidence based on previous successes, which will then be based on previous instances of the CEO effectively following this logic. It's very, very difficult for a CEO of a public company to do something very strange or very unusual or very different. And so uh, today, I think the, uh, the right is very worried about totalitarianism. Uh, it's worried about a kind of, you know, uh, especially on social media, kind of uh, weird embedded alliance between the state and uh, the social media corporations to dominate public speech. Uh, and to dominate the culture. Mm -hmm. And conversely, uh, the left is very much worried about a tyranny on the part of Donald Trump, which I think is really, it's very difficult to get a tyrant in a global system that's as complicated as the one we have. Even in countries where there is someone who resembles a tyrant, you know, the, the tyrant, if they don't comply with the global incentive structure, tends to not last very long. Tyrants who try to go their own way or do something innovative or distinctive have a very difficult time getting by. Plato talks all the time about how hard it is to be a tyrant because you're under all of these incentives to do things that are necessary to stay alive. And the logic of staying alive is not that different from the logic of an impersonal bureaucracy. Uh, so I think sometimes the worry about tyranny is overblown. But in this country, you know, the United States was built very much as an anti-tyranny system. It was not built as an anti-totalitarianism system. Uh, it, is not very good at recognizing those kinds of problems as forms of authoritarianism or as authoritarian problems. Yeah, and uh, when you're when you're speaking, especially about um, these issues, it reminds me of like the election that happened not too long ago in Brazil with Bolsonaro, and even now there are like charges being pressed against him, and I think he's hiding out in like Mar-a-Lago or somewhere in Florida, um, and everyone was comparing him as the Trump of Brazil for a long time. And uh, what I found funny is like foreign policy wise, it seems like him and Lula have some of the same foreign policy. I think it's on some of the domestic and social cultural issues where they're very different. And uh, there are now, I think it was the Washington Post reporting that, um, you know, it was like Bernie talking about it too, but the CIA, uh, the CIA kind of chose Lula and it backfired a little bit on them because he's, he's a really pro Assange guy. And I see <laughs> talks of that um, happening, but you know, to your point, uh, Bolsonaro did not hold power. He did not have the military's aid on his side, even in a place like Brazil, which is not uh, the same as America and doesn't have like the same um, anti-tyrannical origins that that are are here. So the way you displayed the kind of different routes in which things could go wrong, but they haven't gone wrong, is is interesting for the basic economic policies you have you know speaking of bolsonaro one of the interesting things he did before he left is he wiped out like 90 to 95 percent of the student debt there whereas here you know we're still fighting in the courts over like ten thousand or twenty thousand for some people it it kind of made me ponder and wonder um when you write about authoritarianism and totalitarianism and, and democracy is there any one of these forms of government that you think lend themselves to more easily getting these policies policies passed for working class people? Well, I think, you know, oftentimes on the left, you're supposed to start from the assumption that democracy is good and that if you don't have democracy, uh, that's bad. And if things aren't working, it's because your system isn't sufficiently democratic uh, or your democratic system has too many contradictions in it. And so what you need is democracy without contradictions, democracy that's not hypocritical. Uh, and I think that this is not really a position you arrive at if you think about all of this. This is a position that you arrive at if you start from the premise that you have to be committed to democracy. So whatever it is that you like has to become democracy. And part of what marks this crisis is that everybody's decided that what they want can be made compatible with democracy uh, and that democracy should be defined in such a way that it gives them what they want. Mm -hmm. That said, I don't think that those people are, are authoritarian. I think they are sincerely committed to democracy. And if you uh, structured the system in a way that struck them as you know, obviously authoritarian, uh, they wouldn't care for that at all. Under Obama, it was still the case that 66% of Democrats felt that you shouldn't strengthen the powers of the president. And under Trump, it was the case that 66% of Republicans felt the same way about it. There's all this talk on the left about you know abolish the Senate to make the yeah. uh, House of Representatives more powerful, but only 30% of the public is interested in doing anything really to change structure. And the Electoral the College. Yeah, yeah. I, there's a little bit more support for that, but mm -hmm. even if you did change that, you, you know, European countries don't have the Electoral College. It doesn't make them immune to all of this, right? 
And you know, a lot of European countries have a weaker upper house or no functional upper house, and it doesn't actually empower them to do anything dramatically different. I think that uh, a, lot of, a lot of what's going on is that we are trying to find a way to introduce procedures or reforms that will make this system work without the need for a different political system. Mm -hmm. I think in historically, I'm not saying that there is a different political system that's straightforwardly better. I think when you start trying to design, say, non-democratic political systems that are explicitly non-democratic, a lot of the same procedural problems show up. You know, how do you make it dynamic? How do you make it credible? How do you protect against uh, totalitarianism or tyranny? You know, uh, what people uh, think people overlook about monarchical political theory is that it's very interested in the problem of tyrants. Uh, probably no uh, part of political theory is more interested in issues with tyrants than monarchy because monarchy is such a tyranny prone system. Uh, so a lot of these same issues do get kicked up even when you start to frame things as, as uh, non-democratic. What I you know, kind of want to emphasize here is that I think when you have a political system that is only competing with other versions of itself, which isn't really competing with non, with alternatives that are explicitly not it, that that system tends to get fat and happy. And because American democracy no longer competes with communism or fascism or something else of that kind in any serious way, it is never really in danger in such a way that it would be forced to make concessions to the population to try to buy the population off. And when it does make concessions, these concessions are really piddling. It's incredible how cheaply the American people get bought off by the government. Mm -hmm. you, know, you send home a little check for you know 2,500 bucks and people go, the president loves me. Yeah. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. With a big, how, a big John Hancock of your own on there. Yeah. yeah, it's ridiculous how cheaply you buy people off uh, here. And it's because people people know they have no leverage. So if the heat, they didn't, if he didn't send the check, what would they do? It's not like they'd go out into the street or, or stage a strike. They're not in unions. They're not in organizations that could organize them to do that. You know, in the 60s civil rights era, the churches were you know, muscular and, and organizing people to protest. You don't have this anymore. People aren't organized in such a way that they could go out in general strike and cause all sorts of trouble. So there's very, very little in terms of leverage because there are no organizations that are significant in scale or scope that are actually hostile to the state and promoting some genuine alternative system of government. And the people who have thoughts along this line are afraid to actually do anything with them and go, well, it's impractical and it's bad for my career if I do anything with them. So I'm going to uh, stay in my hole and uh, try to convince myself that the reforms that appear more realistic can be made to work. But historically, the reforms only work when the state is afraid that it might fall if it doesn't pass the reform, that the possibility of the state being overturned in a revolution is necessary for change to take place. Uh, and that is something that people are not comfortable with because, of course, for the threat of revolution to be credible, there have to be cases in which it actually happens. And when it does happen, it tends to go very badly. And at mm -hmm. this point, we all know this. We all know that it tends to go very badly when you have a revolution or you introduce an alternative system of government. So we don't actually have a willingness to threaten the state in that kind of way. Or if we do, it's obvious that it's performative and that we're not serious about it and that it's it's a kind of a, a ironic po posturing, that it's not real. And so this is why the state really isn't all that concerned about, say, you know, Donald Trump can get renominated for president. It's not going to really risk anything. The journalists who write about this stuff in the media, they think it's dangerous, but they're not in the state. They're not the people with the guns who make the decision about whether or not Donald Trump is able to be a dictator. It's the people in the security services in the army who make those decisions. Uh, and they pretend that they're not political and don't make those decisions precisely because that is what they do. They do decide whether or not they're going to follow the orders. Uh, and when they don't like the president, the first thing they start to do is leak things. The mm -hmm. next thing they do is try to get the president in legal trouble. And it can escalate from there as necessary, but they don't find that they have to go very far down those roads. They certainly don't feel that they're so worried about the next election that they have to stage a coup to protect the country from the opposition party's nominee. This is not Greece in the, in the 60s. It's really, really not. But 
you know, be, because we have we have a whole media ecosystem which is rump professionals writing for fallen professionals, rump professionals who are not part of the state or are marginally attached to the state or attached to institutions that have a servile relationship either to the state or to oligarchs. Uh, this discussion increasingly just has nothing to do with the reality of what's going on and everything to do with generating clicks and generating money and getting people to sign up for Patreons and all the rest of that <laughs> stuff. Yeah, so is this is this part of the despair that, that you talk about towards the end of the book? Yeah, I think the ordinary person looks at all of this and goes, why would I want to have anything to do with any of this? Why would I want to follow politics? Why would I want to follow the news? Uh, and why why should the ordinary person? Because it doesn't benefit them in any way to follow it. It just gets them worked up and upset. Uh, there's very little reason to follow any of this stuff uh, if you are an ordinary person who's not incorrigibly political in the way that maybe somebody like I am, right? Uh, so I think, the, you know, I talk in the book about uh, the American subaltern. And the concept of the subaltern gets used a lot in post-colonial studies to try to reference, you know, populations that don't speak a Western language and so can only be heard through a Western translator. You know, Spivak you know, tried to argue that uh, what Gramsci was really doing with the concept of the subaltern was talking to about uh, a population that isn't able to actualize, uh, isn't able to be a citizen, a subject who's not able to be a citizen because the subject uh, doesn't speak the necessary language to make demands that can be heard. And when the subject tries to speak, it's always through a translator who distorts or perverts it in such a way that it can be made amenable to the existing system. Uh, I think that the idea of the subaltern is better understood as the ordinary experience of the citizen living in a Western country. And I think that's what Gramsci, the person who invented that expression, I think that's what he meant. He was talking about Italian and French politics. And his point, I think, uh, is that the ordinary person is nominally a citizen and has all these political capacities ascribed to them and is told they live in a democracy, they have the ability to, to do all of this stuff. Uh, but if they actually try to use any of these capacities to do anything, they find that they don't actually have the capacities that have been ascribed to them. And if they then go, well, I don't have these capacities, so I'm not going to bother. They are morally censured over and over again. How dare you not vote? And how dare you not participate? And how dare you not follow the news and be ignorant of public affairs? It's a democracy. You have obligations as a citizen. You know, and they, they get screamed at a bunch, right? But if they actually try to do anything, nobody wants to hear from them. In any organization they might try to join, the professionals have, have no interest at all in being persuaded by anything they have to say and are focused first and foremost on getting them to sign up to the existing projects that exist, finding a way to generate in them feelings of hope or fear that can get them enlisted in some particular project and can get their money too, if possible. Uh, so I think that ultimately, uh, this part of the population goes into a kind of despair about politics and it pivots from politics into other seemingly non-political zones where you can get committed to other life projects that are not obviously political life projects. In my book, I call these the four Fs, faith, family, fandoms, and futurism. And the difficulty with those Fs is that there is a constant effort to repoliticize those spaces because as more and more Americans get fed up with all of this and drop out, there are way more votes in the despairing dropped out fringe voter pool than there are in the set of people who might switch from party to party, election to election. The swing mm -hmm. voters are very, very limited now in number. And the fringe voters who will only vote if you really go to great lengths to activate them, that's the, the much larger chunk of people now. And that's what has changed so much of campaigning in the last 20 years. You are no longer interested in flipping a voter from one party to another. You are now interested in activating someone who might only vote for one of the two parties and only if you get them emotional before the election. So I think that what's happening is that these spaces are getting uh, infected with politics. So we're seeing churches uh, polluted by people who couldn't cut it in politics or couldn't cut it in media, and people who are becoming priests so that they can have influence in a community and are trying to leverage that for political purposes. Uh, in the family, we're seeing uh, cultural issues surrounding the family to do with you know, people's kids and the schools. Yeah. These are becoming intense issues. At the same time, the economic resources available to actually run a functioning family, to buy a house, to raise your own kids without having to pay somebody else to do it, uh, this is you know, increasingly not available. 
The Democratic Party makes noises about helping people with families, but never actually follows up. None of the you know, Biden programs about stabilizing families actually passed. They were terrible policies that didn't actually give parents meaningful uh, ability to raise their own children. And even they didn't pass. They didn't even manage to pass the subsidies for child care that they talked about. They couldn't even do that. You know, it's incredible how little support there is for uh, people who want to have children or who want to buy homes. Uh, so there's that zone, uh, which is shrinking. And so now we have more and more people who aren't able economically to form families, uh, who are also out on churches because they've been let down so badly by these political professionals who come into the churches and tr treat the churches as ways of doing politics. So these people now are getting into the fandoms and into concepts of futurism. So they're becoming uh, followers of particular entertainment companies, tech companies, tech oligarchs uh, that are supposed to give them an escape, give them a fantasy or a science fiction world. So I think in, in the fandoms, we see people who are looking for a completely fantastical escape in the here and the now, and they tend to be uh, poorer. They tend to be economically less well off than the people who are into futurism. Uh, people who are into futurism tend to be like STEM professionals in particular. Uh, and the reason that they're into it is that they can imagine that their work, which is not otherwise fulfilling, is contributing towards some kind of wonderful future that will eventually come into being. And there are these charismatic figures, you know, like an Elon Musk or mm -hmm. uh, a not so charismatic Mark Zuckerberg or a Bill Gates once upon a time or a Steve Jobs. And these people are you, you trust that they're a genius and because they're a genius, you, you know that if you follow them, eventually you will find a future that's exciting and new and different. Uh, and they make people feel that it's okay to waste their lives doing jobs that don't actually uh, amount to very much, but it, it allows people to keep, keep going. And that's really the function of these four apps. They're enclaves that allow people to keep going, but because of their relationship to politics and to the economy, they never actually deliver what they promise. And so people go into them and then they end up getting fed up and you see new versions of despair with people exiting churches, people getting divorced, people abandoning their children in some cases, uh, you know, people getting you know, way, way too into uh, entertainment fandoms and then you're know, replicating all the same yeah. cultural wars over, you know, how the, you know, people go to the convention and how people, you know, on subreddits, incredibly nasty flame wars about trivial things, you know, all replicating the same problems that were in politics. Uh, and the same thing goes with, with futurism, with the, uh, the tech oligarchs uh, trying uh, very hard to uh, not get too political, I think. Once they get a taste of it, they realize it's a mistake to actually get involved in politics because once they get involved in politics, the polarities start to infect their own businesses. Like Zuckerberg, I think, understands this. Musk doesn't quite yet. He will. Uh, but uh, Zuckerberg un understands that if Facebook is a political football, that this will create all these incentives for people to give him a hard time. He gets dragged in front of Congress. People talk about trust busting him. People talk about regulating him in ways he doesn't want to be regulated. So you know, the, the move for Zuckerberg was to just depress political content in the Facebook algorithm substantially, to just make it much harder to try to use Facebook to do any kind of politics. So when you go on Facebook, it's just your grandma and your teachers from school mm -hmm. and you know, nothing else, just dead, dead on Facebook, right? Musk hasn't quite yet figured that out. Uh, he's losing a lot of money because he hasn't figured that out. But uh, the more you try to be political, the more people will attack the genius credentials, which are actually the key to that entire business model, the, the key to the, the tech oligarch business model is that this person's a genius and if you follow them, they will lead you somewhere that you wanna go. Uh, I also think that there's some Marxists who have gotten on the futurist wagon by assuming that if you just keep letting the market develop, that eventually it will produce the revolutionary situation. So you should just accelerate this process as much as possible to get to the revolutionary situation. I've been interested sometimes in a little bit of acceleration, mm -hmm. but in a kind of medium term scale, not that kind of grand big acceleration that's just about immiserating everybody. Uh, but for instance, I did I did want people to have to deal with the fact that Joe Biden lost in 2020. I think that would compel people to rethink what they were doing. It didn't happen. And now, now we're heading into, they all said during 2020, when I debated people about this, they all said, oh, don't worry. In 2024, he won't run again. He'll step, He'll step away. Step yeah. <laughs> and then we can beat Harris with some other candidate. Yeah. Uh, this was just, it's incredible. Just like RBG of, stepped away, right? 
yeah. the cope, <laughs> the amount of cope that people came out with because they didn't want to have to wrestle with this situation. Yeah, it, it's it's so fascinating. The um, the fandoms I knew less about, but I kind of do know because growing up reading sci-fi and fantasy and seeing the LARPers and, and seeing those arguments, I, I do see the ways in which they're political. The futurists, I, I definitely see. And it's it's fascinating this week, actually, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Elon Musk have been doing the most working class thing that I've seen in a long time, which is challenging each other to a fight. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg actually trains BJJ and MMA. Uh, Elon Musk uh, claims that he barely works out. So unless he has a very powerful alpha version of the uh, or beta version of the Neuralink, I don't know how he's going to uh, be able to prepare for that um, combat. And I, I wonder if that's a, a marketing strategy to kind of uh, relate to people more. But the political thing is interesting because I agree with you. There's a sense in which whether he likes it or not, whether he identifies as kind of an old school liberal, Elon Musk, but he he's uh, i think at minimum you know a little bit right of center in in terms of where he's landing but he does kind of present the opportunity he's doing that equality of opportunity if not that equity that you you talk about in your book and those distinctions of uh, equality of outcome the outcome is that you aren't getting a lot of like left pundits taking advantage of direct uploads to twitter and um getting on twitter spaces with him you know you're getting uh, ron DeSantis and people like that uh but but so you do see his kind of rhetoric and an aim or opportunity, but it doesn't seem like a lot of people are taking him up on it. At the same time, everyone who said they were going to have an exodus to Mastodon was about as many people uh, on the right who said they were going to go to Canada when Obama was uh, elected. And and none of that really. Uh, I still see the Mastodon um, socials in some people's bios, but I, I don't think en masse that worked out just like Truth Social didn't work out. Um, sometimes certain things just kind of uh, stick. The faith uh, element you're talking about amongst the four Fs, I think we saw play out recently in my locale between Armenians, who are typically Armenian Orthodox Christians in communion with my fellow uh, Ethiopian Christians, versus um, uh, people trying to celebrate pride in a particular ways for children. And then on the East Coast, surprisingly, the it was, it was Muslims kind of in that similar solidarity against uh, similar pride celebrations for children. And what that's funny too is it's a callback to what you said earlier of this post-McGovern strategy because the post-McGovern strategy is that you get a lot more immigrants and then you'll have this giant coalition. But what do you do when the immigrants have these these other you know categories uh, of fun? Particular uh, brand of politics that you thought that they were going to come uh, when you kind of granted them that that access to your country, and and you sort of uh, you close the book by critiquing a lot of these approaches. It's it's amazing because it's like um, it's like you're you're arguing against yourself because you present the arguments and you're arguing you're like critiquing them and and making them um, refined at the end. What are the alternatives or solutions available to people when you when you look at all all of this landscape? Yeah, so in the last chapter, I kind of try to give myself a hard time. I give my own ideas a hard time. And uh, and then in the epilogue, I give myself personally a little bit of a hard time about all the different positions I've had over the years with regard to all of this. Uh, and I think that as far as reform goes, the best idea I have is the idea that you could try to use both parties at the same time in an ambidextrous way. The difficulty is finding anybody who would want to financially support an organization that uses both parties, which I think is very hard. I think in all likelihood, I could see maybe some possibility of you know, people trying to rebuild the labor movement with help from class trader rich people who, because they have enough resources to be able to kind of stand outside of this and, and the logic of it, uh, might get interested in other kinds of projects. We've seen in other societies, sometimes you have individual uh, wealthy people who sometimes defect from what would appear to be their class interest for personal reasons. They think they can gain something at the expense of other people. Oftentimes it's based on envy or, or not getting along with some of the, the other people in their class. Uh, you know, I talk about that as, as maybe something we could do. We could have like a pair of party that runs uh, candidates in both party primaries. So it's not in the third party zone and, and because a lot of that stuff doesn't really work because uh, for one, a lot of states, if you uh, get any size as a third party, they force you to adopt 
primaries. And once you have to adopt primaries, now you are in the business of having a campaign that people can enter and people can spend money to register people to vote uh, you know, a, as supporters of your party. And all of that can just allow your party to be penetrated by outside money. I think there's mm -hmm. a, a need to protect an organization that would try to do this from that kind of pressure. So you'd need an organization that wasn't formally a party, but ran candidates on party ballot lines. Uh, then you'd have to, you know, you'd have to come up with something for these people to do when they haven't won enough seats to be able to do the things that they would like to do. Uh, that doesn't just involve regressing back into culture war, because of course with culture war, you can say things that people like or people don't like. And this uh, distracts from the fact that you don't do anything. You know, I talk about uh, representation as standing for versus acting for. The less you can act, the more you can try to stand for something. Uh, standing, of course, involves just standing still. You're not doing anything, but you look like you are committed to something. You're dressed up like you are. Uh, and I think a lot of our politicians are in this kind of standing for camp where they don't mm -hmm. act for people, but they do stand for some things. I, the danger with that is that if you only have moderate level of penetration, because what we're dealing with are global problems to do with the tax rates, to do with labor policy, to do with uh, wages globally, it's very, very difficult if you say are in a, a municipal government or a state government to make policy that will make big strides in improving the lives of ordinary people. There's some stuff you can do with land use when you're dealing with you know, land that is only located where it is and can't move somewhere else, uh, that gives you a little bit more weight when you're dealing with land use. And I think that there's some room for getting a little bit more critical about what we do with land and thinking a little bit more about it. I think a lot of the strategies that people have right now involving land are ill thought out. You know, some of this YIMBY stuff where you, you just build <laughs> a bunch of high capacity housing and yeah. you ignore the fact that you don't have the infrastructure to allow those people to move around through public transport and you don't have the infrastructure to allow all those additional cars on the roads in those areas. And then people go, oh, well, you'll just have to spend a bunch of money redoing the infrastructure. Where do you get that from? Uh, you know, this kind of stuff I think is a ill thought out, but it's, I think it might be possible to imagine a kind of housing or land use policy that's more thought out. And that might maybe over time, you know, you might be able to, to win some more seats and some more elections that way. And eventually you might be able to get to the point where you know, maybe you could try to do something more dramatic. Maybe Notice how many maybes I have to yes. say to get this far, right? And then when you get big, you know, maybe you can uh, try to talk to other states about, you know, let's, let's uh, renegotiate these treaties that we use to govern trade and, and govern tax rates. And, and let's get, you know, real robust minimum standards so that everybody's on a level playing field and it's fair. And, the issue you're going to find is that other countries aren't going to be very trusting of us because when we negotiate treaties and then the president changes, we just rip them up or we, we leave. And other countries know this, so we're not very credible for negotiating new big agreements about how the world's going to be run. Uh, so maybe you go, okay, uh, if people won't negotiate with us or they, they don't trust us, then maybe we have to go it alone. We have to just uh, endure a period in which supply chains are disrupted to construct a different global economic order that uh, centers the interests of our ordinary people more effectively. Uh, the issue there is that there's going to be inflation. If there's an election during that inflation, you're probably going to lose. Yeah. And if you lose enough elections, then all of these policies will be reversed. Uh, and if you run on doing these things, you know, you're going to really mobilize a lot of, of angry rich people against you. And they're going to really come out hard to try to sink your campaign. And they're going to do it by kicking up every kind of cultural and foreign policy antagonism they can. They're going to try to imply that you're in bed with various foreign powers. They're going to try to uh, break apart your coalition on the basis of tiny minutia issues that they have no real ability to do anything about anyway. Now, all of that's very difficult. The alternative is, you know, to, to try to promote some kind of revolutionary politics. But then you have all these problems that we have with revolution. Namely, you know, the kind of person that you need to theorize a revolution is very different from the kind of person that you need to actually tear apart mm -hmm. an existing order. And that person is very different from the person who would be committed to building a new system that would work. Right? And all three of those people are very different types of people. And each of them would build a different organization that is not really oriented toward the other goals. So how do you get these people to move out of the way for each other? Well, the history of revolutionary organizing is that they don't move out of the way for each other. They stay too long. So you have the people who theorize the thing but won't tear apart the new system and who just make something that's completely theoretical. And then as soon as it's time to do anything, they just argue over the language. 
right? Then you have the, the teardown artist who can't build anything and just burns everything endlessly, you know, like the leaders of the Khmer Rouge, right? And then you've got you're know, the person who's committed to, to building, but that person at earlier stages will be committed to maintaining the thing that already exists and, and making it work a little bit better. That person won't actually do what's necessary to bring about revolutionary change. That person only comes along in a period of chaos, and that period of chaos visits so much misery upon people that by that point, very often, people are just happy to go back to the way it was, and the new order ends up not very different from the order you previously had. In that section, I quote people like you know, Tocqueville and uh, mm -hmm. about you know, what, what actually happens when you get to the end of the revolutionary generation, they've all killed each other. What happens, you go back to something like what you had before, because at this point, you're so tired you just want order and stability. Uh, and this is the thing that ultimately haunts the revolution is that order, peace, uh, survival, these are human values too. And they're things people care about and people institute states in part because they want these things. And if you have a state that doesn't deliver those things, uh, people aren't gonna stick with it for very long, no matter how enthused they might be about the abstract values that the thing is ostensibly committed to. So uh, nevertheless, I do think that there is a need for some amount of revolutionary organizing, not because I think that revolutions can work, but because I think if there aren't revolutionary organizations, there's just not enough pressure on the state to deliver. But then if you ask me to like actually endorse some kind of revolutionary movement, I have a very hard time mm -hmm. giving you something you know, uh, revolutionary that I would endorse. And I think this is what really speaks to the problem that we have here. Once you acknowledge that we're not gonna get here with reform, that seems to imply having a revolutionary attitude. But we can't actually have a revolutionary attitude because we have too much historical experience regarding revolutions to be able to be uncritically and idealistically for them in the way that people in the 19th century were for them, which is why I don't like the recent comparisons that have been made by some people on the left who I like and respect to the 1848 moment. The 1848 moment was a moment where people loved revolution, believed in it, and if anything, the problem is that it was being squashed uh, mm -hmm. Nobody believes in revolution anymore. Uh, nobody, including you know, most of the people who frame themselves as revolutionaries, most of them are just doing it performatively uh, or just doing it because they think it's good for their career, uh, would not actually do what's necessary, would never actually try to persuade someone with a gun to shoot somebody. Uh, and, and this is the thing, you have to be willing to either do violence or have violence done to you. You know, at minimum, you have to have a kind of Gandhian attitude of a willingness to be shot for a society that does not exist. And I think part of the trouble here is that there's no belief among people anymore that there is a society that doesn't exist that would be worth being shot for. There's a lack of confidence in the capacity of human beings to build societies that are worth living in, a kind of creeping, all-encompassing nihilism, a void that is sucking at everything. Uh, that causes us to think that there is nothing worth dying for and that survival is is really all that we ought to value. And so when people really go into despair and they give up on survival, uh, they just kill themselves or they you know commit suicide by cop or they commit a mass shooting. They don't organize anything uh, revolutionary. They don't actually try to do politics with that feeling. And I think unless people do politics with that feeling, we're just going to keep going in loops. And I think this should worry people, that this, this fact that I am not able to, to give you something that sounds like a good solution. I have done a PhD and I've spent years and years of my life trying to think of something useful that we could do to make the world better for the ordinary person. And I'm really having a hard time saying anything that doesn't sound stupid to me. Uh, and I, it should concern, I think, everybody. It should be obvious to, to people, if we were actually gonna have change, it should be obvious to large numbers of people without any education that these changes are necessary and what they are and how you would go about doing them. You know, when people talk about you know, uh, revolutionary situations, revolutionary moments, moments that give rise to revolutionary behavior, these are situations where it just becomes apparent to people without any great level of training or education what it is we ought to do. Uh, and when we look at our society, we don't see a bunch of people who are just of their own accord arriving at what to do. We see people who are very confused, who feel that there's no meaning in what they're doing, who have retreated into you know, everything anybody does. There's a bunch of other people who will say it's a code. There are very few things that you can be doing that, that uh, you couldn't find a theorist who would go, ah, that's just a way of you know diverting the, the resentment and the energy that would otherwise go into revolution. Uh, 
And yet, you know, those theorists too are content with critique. They are not actually revolutionary organizing. Yes, I've I've seen this sapping of revolutionary energy the way you've described it. The closest thing that I've seen to this actual energy, and still, it was uh, in two cases a response to procedural changes that they uh, could not stomach, and it still had a performative element to it. Was what I saw recently in France and in Israel over uh, some of the judiciary and executive changes that the people felt like were roughshod over them um, and you know retirement ages changing things like that but they seem to be uh, you know procedural critiques that had a little bit of fervor that were uh, pr uh, like I said procedural in nature and then performative in how they did it and then they kind of sizzled out balance between reform using revolution as a counterbalance but not leaning all the way into it and balancing upon those people willing to take uh you know as he said be the be the guys with the guns uh versus the kind of the the thinking uh people who are the 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 kind of um the clouds or the the big picture um people there is especially i guess my last question because uh, you mentioned it again it reminds me of of the russia situation putin had said something along the lines of what you said uh, he had seen, you know, three to four presidents come and go. And so it almost sounded like you were making an argument to, uh, you know, people often want more term limits, but maybe less, less term limits or longer, longer reign in, in the executive office as, as potentially one of the things that, that could have a longer term uh, view. But do you think the, uh, you mentioned the Ukraine war earlier, do you think the kind of economic sanctions and everything that had uh, gone on with Russia had not caused any supply chains? I know as for like places like Germany, I heard that they've been like back buying from India who's buying from Russia. But in the American situation, do you think there has been any disruption of the supply chain due to the war with uh, the proxy war with Russia via the Ukraine? Yeah, good question. Uh, on the issue of France, I, I heard a, a chant about, you know, Macron, Macron, we did this to Louis the Sixteenth, And, you know, when I heard that, I went, that was a long time ago. <laughs> the last few times people in France took guns out and used them to make a new regime, you know, it was the move from the Fourth Republic to the Fifth, which was, you know, a move toward Gaulism. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, you know, there, there's the collapse of the Third Republic to the Vichy regime, you know, which is, you know, not at all anything anybody wants to replicate or repeat. So, uh, yeah, I, I think in France, taking to the street helps to slow the pace of these reforms, but it hasn't fundamentally changed the situation. In France, these reforms happen slower because people are more willing to strike, but it hasn't fundamentally changed the game there going forward. Uh, and it's still the case that France is moving in that direction. The labor market reforms that Macron proposed, those went through. Uh, he shunted those through. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, that's kind of uh, what I have to say about France. As far as uh, Russia and Ukraine goes, the, the thing that is just stunning to me is how effectively the West has managed to push the consequences of that conflict onto poor developing states. To mm -hmm. me, the thing that really stands out about this is what's going on in Pakistan, what's going on in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, the increase in the number of children who are malnourished because their parents can't afford food, the struggle on the part of these states to produce enough energy to keep the lights on because their states can't acquire enough oil and gas, and the, the commitment that Pakistan is making to building an enormous number of new coal-fired power plants as a consequence of this. I mean, people talk about, isn't this great? We're getting off Russian oil and gas. We're building renewables. Meanwhile, in the developing countries, they're building coal plants because they want cheap, immediate solutions to pressing human needs. Uh, I think that the West has very effectively pushed the consequences of this stuff onto poor countries. Western states have just bought up this stuff and eaten the inflation, more or less, uh, while poorer states are unable to buy oil and gas, unable to buy grain, uh, and therefore at greater risk of civil conflict and instability. If in terms of you know, goods trade, you know, one of the things that's incredible to see uh, over the last 10 years, Almost all of the growth in consumption in the OECD has come from the United States. The European countries are really struggling to continue to grow uh, their capacity to consume, which makes the entire Western bloc more dependent on the United States economically over time. 
Uh, if the OECD is, is just really just American consumption powering uh, through, uh, that makes it very difficult for European states to have some kind of uh, you know, autonomy in foreign policy. And I think we're seeing that with you know, the European states did not really want uh, this conflict with Ukraine of this intensity this close by. And the United States just bullied them into it. And it was really remarkable how easily the United States bullied these countries into it and how weak they were in response to that bullying. Um, I think that what we're seeing in terms of supply chain disruption is, you know, again, it's boosting inflation by a little bit, but it's really incredible how limited the inflationary spike has been. Like if you look at developing countries that have major supply chain issues, they get inflation that's double digit, they get soaring. You look at like Turkey and the lira, you get crazy inflation. It's remarkable that our inflation rate is, you know, about 5%. I mean, during 09, I remember the uh, Keynesians were making the argument that we should set a high inflation target of 4%, that that would optimize growth in the United States to have a little bit of a higher inflation target than we previously had. And of course, that got a lot of pushback on the right because that threatens the rate of return on capital. Uh, but basically, we have an inflation rate that for those guys is almost healthy. Uh, and we have that amid you know, major disruptions to European oil and gas uh, trade. And, ag and we're selling liquefied natural gas to the Europeans, and the Europeans are having to buy it, and they're so aggravated at having to buy it that they're buying Russian gas piped through the Middle East to try to yeah. avoid having to buy it. The Europeans are really looking shabby lately. Um, but you know, I think uh, when we look at the overall picture in terms of the U.S. trade deficit, when we look at uh, all, all the trade accounts with all these different states, it really hasn't changed that much. Everything that we see is just a tiny little frothing on the surface of all of this stuff. And I think that it really shows, I, I mentioned earlier how people immediately when COVID hit went, this is gonna be a whole new paradigm and it's gonna change everything. And after 2008, people said, this is a whole new paradigm and it's gonna change everything. And after 9-11, people said, this is a whole new paradigm and it's gonna change everything. And what we find is when there's an immediate crisis, there's some stabilizing measures that go out, there's some quantitative easing, some fiscal stimulus if there needs to be, some bailouts for some institutions if they need to be bailed out, you know, cash injections, you know, paycheck protection program, stuff like that, right? You ride that out. Sometimes it gives you a little inflationary bump or a bump in the price of oil, but you can, you can survive that politically. It doesn't cause the state to collapse. And then once you get past that bump, then you gradually wind things back by jacking up the interest rate, by cutting the state spending, by lowering, uh, you know, and then you, you eventually you lower the tax rates to goose people along again and get them moving because you've cut spending, so you've got some room to lower the rates again. And this is the cycle that we've been in where we cut taxes to force spending cuts later, then we make spending cuts to enable tax cuts later, and the capacities of the state get narrower and narrower and narrower and more and more of the services that the state used to provide are offloaded to these big corporations that only care about market incentives and nothing else, that will leave large numbers of people unable to afford college, unable to afford healthcare, unable to buy a house, and won't care because that's not their objective. Their objective is just to make money. And if there was a fall in housing prices that enabled young people to buy houses, they're the people who would lose. So they have no incentive at all to fix the housing crisis problem. Uh, and the people who already have houses have every incentive to want to see those houses go up in value. So I think that what we've seen from the Ukraine conflict and what we've seen from COVID is that the level of supply chain disruption that's actually necessary to break the structural incentives that currently compel states to follow this race to the bottom strategy, it needs to be really, really big. And the kinds of disruptions that you would need to have are not things that a reasonable person can argue for. I cannot say that we should start a war with China to break up trade in the Pacific and allow us to reconstitute the economy. Nevertheless, it's very clear from, you know, if you look at the World War period, the way that we were able to construct the whole post-war consensus model is that trade was severed, first by World War I and then again even harder by World War II. And we could basically make the whole international trade system anew, afresh. You could have a, you know, intellectuals come to a Bretton Woods conference and just make an agreement about how to set it up. And that was because you stopped it. It was only because you stopped it that you could decide how to restart it again. And we are not going to stop it if we, if we 
uh, can possibly avoid stopping it because the cost of stopping it, it's mind blowing. It's electoral suicide. Yeah. We can't imagine actually stopping it. And, and people always want to imagine that these little speed bumps are enough. You know, you've got a car that's a race car and you're on the gas and you've got a speed bump that you hit and people go, oh, this will break the car. It won't drive anymore. The amazing thing when you look at your car's suspension when it goes over a speed bump, you think that the speed bump's going to ruin your suspension. But most of the time, even when you hit the speed bump really hard, it doesn't actually damage your car. You think that it does because it feels like such a jolt. This has got to be damaging to my car. But when you actually look at the, the research on this stuff, it doesn't damage your car nearly as often as you think that it would. And that's the nature of these little economic crises. They don't actually damage the car. And in fact, what, what tends to happen is that the crises are managed in a way that weakens future sources of resistance. So if you, you know, shut down a bunch of businesses, and if you uh, do a moratorium on uh, evictions, for instance, all the small holders of property have to sell because they can't handle not being able to evict delinquent tenants for long periods of time. They sell property to the big property owners who get even richer, who are more able to concentrate capital into their hands, right? Uh, that's the consequence of this eviction moratorium, which seems to be a very humane policy aimed at protecting the ordinary homeowner, right? But it isn't actually. Uh, in the long run, what it does is it ensures that in the next crisis, capital is more heavily centralized and therefore easier to command and control from a very small number of vantage points. Uh, and, and the same goes for you know, this stuff to do with, uh, with the crisis uh, in Ukraine, the severing of the ability of the Europeans to buy Russian oil and gas or forcing them to buy it in a mediated way through Middle Eastern countries makes them even more dependent on the United States and mm -hmm. even less able to carve out their own policy. So it looks like something that disrupts the system and potentially weakens it, but actually it makes it more inexorable and more inevitable. Uh, and, and I would never, by the way, advocate for starting a war with China to change, uh, to change this stuff any more than you could advocate for starting the world wars to mm -hmm. change the economic system in the 19th century. Nonetheless, without the world wars, it would have kept going. All of those old families in the 19th century, they would have kept all the money and it would have kept rolling along. Yeah, so we don't want to start a calamity or a catastrophe, but if it arises, we should we should stay ready. Um, where can, thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin Studebaker for elaborating and enticing people. I hope now people are excited to read the full thing. Where can people find, or where would you prefer they go and purchase the chronic crisis of American democracy, the way is shut? Yeah, so the cheapest way to get it is directly from the publisher. That's Palgrave Macmillan. They sell it through springer.link.com. That's the cheapest way to get it. You can get it on Amazon, of course, but the Amazon price is uh, fluctuates more based on what Amazon thinks they can get for it. Uh, whereas at Springer, it will, it will be more consistently affordable. The, uh, the paperback is probably the best way for the ordinary person to get it. Unless you like the ebook, there is a cheap ebook available. Uh, but the, uh, the paperback is probably your best bet for getting it at an affordable rate. Well, thank you so much again for joining us on the program. And where can they follow you? Oh, you can follow me on Twitter, at BM Studebaker. You can go to my um, blog, BenjaminStudebaker.com. On that blog, I update people with every major piece of writing that comes out, uh, every, everything that I do, wherever it is. I let people who follow me uh, at BenjaminStudebaker.com know. I post new posts uh, whenever I have something new come out. You can follow by email. You can follow uh, over Twitter. Technically speaking, I have a public page on Facebook and I will spit out my blog posts there. But of course, thanks to the way that Mark Zuckerberg's reformed Facebook, it's not that useful. <laughs> By the way, I will say, I think that Zuckerberg got the edge on Musk in Oh, you take him? Take him yeah. <laughs> because be, not, not just because he's more able to win the fight, but since Musk proposed the fight but can't actually win the fight, Zuckerberg could say, yeah, I'll do the fight. And now Musk either has to fight somebody he can't beat or back down. So it's a lose-lose for him. That's right. Yeah, there's a huge weight. Dis uh, uh, like I said, there's a huge weight difference between the two. Uh, but Zuck has the skills, it seems. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think the skills would tell. But, you know, who knows? We could be proven wrong. I think that's a fight that, you know, everybody wins from. Uh, you know, watching watching that if it ever does happen but it, yeah, live stream Musk, it must go uh, back off and then and he'll claim that uh, you know he has reasons to to not do it
Absolutely. Absolutely. But it would be, uh, yeah, amazing. Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks.